Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, Please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome. Today, I once again sit down with Bridget Dengel Gaspard. Bridget holds a Master's of Social Work degree from Columbia University and is the founder of the New York Voice Dialogue Institute. Bridget is the author of The Final Eighth. The Final Eighth is a self guided manual for working with your inner voices or parts to get past the fear of success that holds so many of us back from accomplishing our goals and achieving excellence in many domains of our lives. She is here today to continue the conversation about inner voice dialogue, the final eight, and about the process of inner voice dialogue in aging and the human life cycle. Welcome back, Bridget. Hi, Scott. It's really great to be here. Well, thank you. We're happy to have you once again. So I thought maybe we could follow up from that earlier podcast, which was uh, released, I think, in February of this year, 2021. And maybe for those who haven't heard that, we could have you reintroduce the concepts of inner voice dialogue. What is that? So voice dialogue is a technique developed by my mentors, the doctors Hal and Sidra Stone, starting from the 1970s. And it's a revolutionary technique where you literally speak to different parts of yourself, also called alter egos, subpersonalities, inner selves, personas. And the idea is that each part of ourselves has wisdom. And so when you talk to them directly and let them speak without interference, you get a bigger sense of their purpose and how they function in your life. And thus you can make more conscious decisions. And it, the, it reveals and releases the hidden inner conflicts you have that are blocking your goals. Because usually when people are stuck, it's a mystery. Like they know a few things, but why they just are at their final eighth, a.k.a. they've gotten seven-eighths of the way there, so it does not make logical sense what's going on. This is a really powerful technique, and I like how you said my book is self-guided because it really is a book where you can go through it and explore your different selves and see what's going on, especially when you're stuck in like a tug-of-war of being for the goal, certain selves, and certain selves being against the goal. Okay, so basically it's a way to work through inner conflicts that... I'd say most of us, if not all of us, experience from some degree or another most of the time. Absolutely. And you're actually making me think also sometimes we are sure about a decision, like we're not ambivalent about that, but we get stuck in the how. So it even helps you figure out where am I in the stuckness? Is it that I don't have the courage to move forward? And then those would be selves that often you have to cultivate because the other thing about stuckness is often people double down on their usual well, responsible selves or the can do selves and they get more responsible and work harder. But for most people, working harder is not the problem or the solution. And in a way, it can be a type of procrastination and keep you in what I call mirage goals. You keep working harder when that is not the solution. The solution sometimes is you have to go into more tender, vulnerable parts and feel the fear, your fearful self. And we throw away that, uh, throw around that term self sabotage and oh, fear based. Yes. But with voice dialogue, it's much more specific because I don't know that it's often helpful to say, well, that's self-sabotage. Okay, great. Now what? Okay, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, this idea of mirage goals, is that a, a way of like just avoiding those tender parts or what? Can, give me a little bit more of an idea of what that means. Yes, I think mirage goals definitely keep us occupied so that we feel busy and productive, but we, in fact, don't 
really mess with our status quo. So we think we're going after maybe scaling our business, but instead we're researching all kinds of technological tools to do it. And we keep researching and researching. And then of course, everything changes during your research period. And so you have this mirage goal. You think you're going after this one thing, but the activities, the parts of you that keep you busy with it are just you're running that um, hamster wheel and not moving forward and stretching to the edges, which is where um, growth is and transformation. It's almost like people will get lost outside of themselves in details rather than start a dialogue with themselves or face those parts. Yes. And I think a lot of people have terror about strong emotions And I'm not quite clear why that is. I know in, at least it seems to me, Western society, things like weeping and uh, having big emotions can often traditionally be put down as some type of weakness. But I feel like the terror sometimes is bigger than that. People are really scared of their big emotions of grief, shame, sadness. And I think those mirage goals keep them busy, as you said, outside of themselves but they're never going to get anywhere until they you turn back into themselves. Yeah. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the process of, of inner voice dialogue now that we're kind of in this direction. So the classic voice dialogue, and by the way, every third Thursday of the month, we do a free voice dialogue learning lab. So anyone is welcome. Just contact me and it's a free Zoom link. And we do voice dialogue every month so people can actually witness it and get some growth themselves. But it is basically starting in the center because we always go back to center. And that's why voice dialogue is safe. We don't, we want to have control over our different selves. We want to have access. And that's what is a healthy personality consists of many different parts. Mm -hmm. So then with voice dialogue, you move to a different place. It could be, if you have a lot of room, it could be far or even just shift slightly. And part of the reason you do that is you want to make a separation. A lot of times people think I'm just me. And then when you say, well, who, what's just me? They're like, well, I'm responsible and dependable and a loyal family member. Well, we would say those are three parts of you that you lead with. They're primary parts, but they're certainly not all of you. And so if you separate, say, and go to your responsible self and that responsible self gets to talk and my book is full of questions like, what are your early memories? Where do you live in the body? What do you care about? What's your function? What's your gift? What's your sting? And then when you come back, you realize this responsible self that you thought was like just all of who you were is just a part of who you are and that there's actually a sting. Like someone who's uber responsible may actually find out that they're responsible to other people and yet they betray themselves because they don't take care of themselves. So they're actually irresponsible with their own self-care in the name of uh, appropriate socially accepted responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's liberating, but it can also be scary. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's liberating, but like you're mentioning like a responsible part. What, 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 how many parts do you usually see in a person or like what, what might be their characteristics or their names? So with voice dialogue, we let people name themselves, but certain ones that really do seem universal are the inner critic, anxious one, um, fun lover, Uh, and certainly different selves that have substance dependence. And so I think the potential for any number of cells is there for all of us. But in fact, between your temperament and your goals and only having at the most, I don't know, 10 or 11 decades on this planet, that's what curbs what selves you actually embody more than the potential to, um, have different selves and everything is based on normal development. That's another reason I like voice dialogue. Meaning Mm -hmm. when we go from toddler to school age, we automatically have different selves. Now we have a good friend of a peer. We become a student and that's often where there's difficulties. Maybe that's where a rebel first comes out. So with each developmental stage, we naturally are designed to have different selves that are cultivated. 
Mm-hmm. And then when we're aware of it, we can actively cultivate a self. Like I work with many people who don't really have a business person and they want to go out on their own. Well, then they've got to develop their entrepreneur, which isn't just about getting skills, although that's very important. It's about uh, taking initiative, how to handle rejection, having be, having a visionary, having access to your visionary. Well, okay, so you're saying the core, it starts from this, the core and it goes back to core, right? For safety purposes. Can you, is that core, uh, like the kernel of who a person is? Is that the concept in, in inner voice dialogue? Yes. And I know different traditions use different words, but we, what we call that the aware ego process. Mm-hmm. So that there's a, a central you that's, you could, say is like the composer of an orchestra. And then you think you're just uh, flutes and violins and you find out, wow, I have piano and I have drums and I have two von throat singing. And so, but you always want to come back to be able to be a conductor so that if the piano is not appropriate, you have access to bringing in the parts that are appropriate. So that brings in higher purpose goals. Like I want to be an ethical person. So I have to, uh, start with my polite self. But if I have no access to my angry self, that code of ethics, so to speak, is going to make me easily taken advantage of. Mm, Okay. So what I also like about this, you come back to your center or your core, but it really is also situational. It's also cultural. And so it deals with day-to-day life as it happens. People who are progressive. Oh, sorry. No, no. You're, you're basically giving people, uh, a route to be able to start a conversation with themselves, like as opposed to just yeah. having inner do- inner voices that are there already. You kind of curate the process. You help them curate yeah. that and make some sense out of it and, and put some meaning to it. Yes. And I think that's part of the liberation. I keep using that word because energetically that's often how it feels. But right. So then the meaning you put to it is a meaning you care about in present tense. It's it's molting the old rules that you're not even aware that you're trying to be successful in life by your elementary school good girl. And those rules, asking for permission, waiting to go to the bathroom, Mm -hmm. those just don't work. And in fact, can actually impede. But more people than they realize follow these ancient rules from the early days and, and they're not aware of it. And so that's the other part of the inner voice dialogue. When you get a self-talking from its point of view, you, you learn how old-fashioned some of these are. Mm-hmm. And some of that you get to pick and choose, which is great. It's, sometimes I call that detoxing your assets. So the good girl that used to say yes to everybody because that's what your parents liked, you detox the asset of someone who likes to connect with people uh, in a powerful way. But that good girl, if she's in charge all the time, and I'll speak for myself, uh, you won't have anything done in a day because you will be constantly trying to please others. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. And which is what gets a lot of people into trouble. Like, for instance, somebody who's been a good girl all their life, but they've they've said yes to way too many things that are not positive for them, perhaps in a marriage, and they find themselves later on in life, having to facilitate an adult part and, and shift that, that, uh, space within themselves. I don't, maybe you should repeat that because it distorted on my end. Oh, so I don't okay. know if that means it's well, distorted like for on ins- your for end. For instance, like somebody who, like you're mentioning a good girl. So later on in life, it makes contextually, it makes good sense for somebody to be a good girl and, and get along with people at a certain level of life. But if there wasn't a lesson either from the parents uh, or through life lessons that allowed them to be more adult-like or facilitate independence, they could get themselves into a great deal of difficulties in their adult relationships, whether that's in a marriage or otherwise, where they have this inner conflict with maybe a budding or dormant adult self versus the little girl part. Exactly. And if we were to do voice dialogue with that, we would also let that little girl self have grief over the fact that Mm. like things have changed. And so again, back to big emotions, but still, um, if, if you are a few decades on this planet, 
you could like that or not, but your, your inner children, you need to take care of at a certain point and, and not ask the world to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, that's, that's so troublesome. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Um, well, since we're on this topic of like, uh, different parts that have been developed over the lifespan, perhaps you could kind of go into maybe how the model would, would apply to growth through the lifespan and perhaps uh, in old age. And shall we use the M word, maturation? <laughs> <laughs> like also a fine, like a fine, elderhood, maturation, fine wine. Yeah. <laughs> fine wine. Yeah, yes. Right. A smoky scotch. Um, <laughs> the bog needs time to work on its scotch. It's PD. Yes. yes. So, uh, one of the reasons I'm a former performer and I moved, uh, into getting my master's in social work and becoming a psychotherapist in that trajectory, because I realized that I wanted to be part of the next wave, which I don't think is yet defined, but given that present pandemic excluded, generally speaking, there are lots of us who are blessed and lucky and privileged enough to be living for a long, pretty healthy time. And so it occurred to me that whether or not you did the natural rites of passage, so whether or not you got married, whether or not you went to school and graduated, whether you became a parent, you are still at 50, 60 and beyond without any traditional rituals mm -hmm. and rites of passage. And I just thought, what a marvelous time to be alive if you're in connection with that it could be different. And so the way voice dialogue works is that the idea is that when we are born, we're born as an infant, obviously, so we're completely vulnerable. But our essence is part of that, our, our unique blueprint and... Um, and our temperament, you know, things mm -hmm. that we naturally like biologically. Some people are more upset by loud noises. Other people actually like them, those kind of things. And they mm -hmm. all work together. And so vulnerability is a word I realized when I was writing the book. I was just using that word a lot. And I thought, wait a minute, what am I trying to actually say? What is vulnerability? And the root is really to be open. And we naturally think it's to be open to attack. And so the idea is if you can get to the root and be open to your vulnerability, I honestly think it's the new superpower. That's your key as you get older. Here is the fact, not in a negative defeatist way, our bodies change. And if we are open to the vulnerability of that and start to cultivate other selves, selves say that can ask for help, mm -hmm. that aren't rigidly independent so that they get injured because they, they don't have a part that will say, Hey, can you come by and help me put the air conditioner in, for example, because they're used to being strapping and able and putting in the air conditioner, at least in New York city, a lot of us take them in and out the air conditioners yeah. when the summer comes and when the summer goes. And so Hal Stone, who co-created with Sidra voice dialogue told this wonderful story and Hal and Sidra and Hal did pass away a little over a year ago of old age in his bed. He just fell into um, the next transition, whatever that is. And so Sidra is a widow and doing very well. I've actually seen her recently. She's 84, but the two of them shared with a lot of us, their aging process, which always was hooked into vulnerability because uh, long story short, basically in his seventies, Hal went up on the roof and did some roofing before they were expecting some luncheon company. And so he finished the roof thing, went downstairs and realized he'd forgotten one more thing, went back up the ladder, back onto the roof, fell off and broke his back. Hmm. Wow. And was completely dependent. And he, he has a primary self that's impersonal, independent, and he actually completely recovered, no paralysis, but it was that injury 
and recovery that he knew he was blessed to have, that he started to really understand that the part of him that wanted to just jump over the fact that he was 70 something and didn't have the balance and the strength he used to, then he lived 24 more years after that. And he kept saying, I have to lead with different selves. And he talked about it very openly, the things he used to do and then how he navigated the way of, again, for him, it's selves that can accept help, ask for help. And also in voice dialogue, even though it might not be politically correct, we recognize there's archetypes and so that there is the patriarch within and certain expectations and we can have whatever relationship we want with them, but to act like there aren't patriarchal forces and there aren't matriarchal forces, there just are. And he would have to like, let that go. And the other role model I have is Bill Plotkin. I don't know if you've heard of him. He did wild mind hmm. and he talks about elderhood as being just a sacred mm -hmm. um, task. And that as Scott, you and I had talked about last time, it's like young, good, old, bad, this yeah. black and white thinking. We and have a, we have a very this just melts that. <clears throat> yeah. We have a youth centered culture, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Coming from like, even from our own, European Eurocentric background, it's a new thing. It's it's a relatively new thing, I think, in the consumer society of the twentieth century that's been kind of pandered from from America and the West to the rest of the world. But the rest of the world has a respect for elders. A reverence even. Mm -hmm. And and so it should be again not blind devotion. I always say you never accept unacceptable behavior. I don't care of who and what and where you are. Mm -hmm. But I know that I am so much more able to give and have my multiple intelligences and confidence that I've earned. And it's not that I would ever tell a 20 something year old that I know it all because I don't. Mm -hmm. And that's me honoring my vulnerability. I probably felt like I had to lead with my know it all selves in my thirties more than now. And so Hal and Sidra being really important examples, like I got to let that go. And Sidra has a great uh, thing that she shares, which is, you know how um, it's it, when you want to be righteous, like you're right. She's like, righteousness is so delicious. We hate to give it up. But sometimes as an elder, you have to give up these delicious, intense knowings because they're just one part of the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so over time, it sounds like, uh, Hal, basically he, he, he knew at that point in time, he had to like onboard, if you will, or, or give space. I love that. Be, be, yes. be basically vulnerable to one part had to be vulnerable to the fact that it couldn't be the, the independent young men, but it had to be more of a, he had to move into more Senex or more of like the wise elder kind yes. of position and to slow himself down, to pace himself at a at, at different pace. Yeah. And this was a man who in his sixties got his black belt in Aikido wow. just to show you how attached he was. And that was cool, but he could do it in his sixties, <laughs> but just to sort of show how attached he was to being physically strong, mentally strong and and has a part that's like, if there's a challenge, I am going to conquer it. All mm -hmm. wonderful selves. But if you don't have right relationship with those selves, they're going to help you fall off the roof and break your back. Right. Yeah. And it seems like he, he did everything in the first instance, but when he rushed up to go finish something up, that pace had to change. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so... When you're working with patients, does this, this, this story from Hal kind of inform, I should, not patients, you work with clients, but I say patients sometimes. I, I use them interchangeably. But um, when you're working with clients, does this inform you, Hal's story? And do you ever work with people who are, are going into eldership? Yes. Another story that I absolutely share 
in order to inspire my clients, if it comes up and it feels right. And I've had clients weep at this one, which is a long time ago, I had this wonderful 80 something year old woman come in and she had been very creative in her life. She had, um, I'm not going to go into details because of privacy, but it was phenomenal this life that she lived. And she was a leader in a creative area that she was one of the very first people ever in the 1970s and eighties to do certain things. And I'm saying that because she was not someone who hadn't done things and why her treatment goal. I fear I will squander my creativity with the time I have left. That's what she came in to make sure that she wasn't doing. And she was amazing. And, and so I share that story too, that you have to be active about it, but it is valuable. You it's squanderable. Think of it as incredible currency that you can't earn. It's non capitalistic currency. And if your creativity is you want to become an orchid grower, like I don't put any, that's wonderful, but you don't want to sell them. Like I'm not talking about some commercial goal necessarily, or you could be, you might want to have a later business, but, but I really say this universally and, and it could be something concrete, like a career goal, but it could just be, I've done oils all my life and now I want to work with watercolors and I don't want to get stuck and just kind of fritter away my life in, and in, in basic kind of unhappiness. Sometimes I think like that low level dissatisfaction, that's barely, uh, if you're not aware of it, you barely notice that's worse. That's like a slow leak than just having a crisis, which mm-hmm. jolts you awake. Right. As you know, as a therapist, it's like, Oh, the crisis. Now you're going to listen <laughs> and hear not that we have it all, but in the idea that we want them to hear like Do you see and hear what's going on? Now's a chance to shift things. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're working to even facilitate little changes or big change. It doesn't have to be a crisis or for them, it could be a crisis for you. The difference between oils or acrylics and watercolor is like not big, but for that person it is. Yeah. Okay. So like shifting in, in, in routines, jobs, what about the the process of reti- of what they call retirement, the big R word? Have you ever worked with anyone across the lifespan who's doing the retirement and finds that parts of them are feeling abandoned or left behind? Absolutely. And um, I think, at least in my experience, and you can tell me what you see, so it's anecdotal, that little bit of a stereotype that it's in a way harder for men who seem to have a more attached identity to their profession than even professional women. And I don't know if it's because so many women, regardless of whether they had high powered careers or not, they're so, they have a social circle in a way that again, stereotypically, so it's not everybody. And so I think, um, Women naturally have these other selves and it may be where permission is because that's another thing. I warn people, society is going to put these images about what you should be doing as an elder or what you should feel and look like as a female and also as a male. And so that's the also to cultivate parts that are like fierce about not buying that. Mm -hmm. And so um, for example, yeah, I had, uh, actually was, I worked with a couple and they had, they were very, they had mature, responsible parts and they were going to retire together and they were going to move actually to this wonderful Caribbean Island and, and they could afford it. They, they were being very fiscally responsible, but then as we worked together, they realized part, one of their primary, uh, values is their friendships. And they realized that they were going to leave where they lived for no good reason, except kind of that's what they thought that they should do. And so they actually completely changed their plan. They did not move from where they were. And then what they did was travel a lot with many of their friends, which they had done throughout their life. And so the discoveries about like which persons within that they led with, they realized they liked that. And there was, they could go to an island anytime, 
but they would really miss these Sunday morning coffee catch ups and those kind of things that simply can't happen if you're not local. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, right. And there's a lot of assumptions about what you're supposed to do in retirement. Maybe you kind of force down our, our, our gullets by consumerism or like just, you know, uh, scripts that have been not very recently uh, created for uh, a person to follow. Right? And this, at this point in time, you do this and you do that. And it just so happens that many people believe that when they retire, they're supposed to go live on an island somewhere or go live in Florida or some, you know, in a, and leave where they're at, which, yeah. So it sounds like you have to kind of like negotiate with the part of themselves that have believed something like that. And then the process really helps you figure out, well, what resonates now, you know, and that's, that's what you ultimately want to know. Like, and, and there is no right or wrong. And that's what I meant earlier about the next wave. The next wave I think could be like, wow, I could choose a buffet. And now they've even divided old age. So now that there's extreme old age, so that there's a real recognition, there's sort of later middle age, but these are de um, developmental phases. I think that are legitimate. Mm -hmm. Again, in a privileged society where it's assumed you pass certain marks, it's not what happens with everyone, of course. And mm -hmm. then also the role model. You, you, what kind of role model do you want to be? I feel personally I'm lucky because I've had role models, the women in my life, meaning my mother, grandmother, great aunt. Unfortunately, uh, the men seem to die early, so it's not against them. It's just they weren't there. But they had later careers, like my great aunt, who was born in 1893, who died in like 1993. Um, she started teaching English as a second language in her 70s. Wow. She got a degree? She no, you, but, I think, it, I think it's because at the it, time yeah. we yeah. had a lot of people come or refugees coming from the Vietnam area. And there may well not and, have been a degree of any sort at the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but, uh, she had been a teacher, so it wasn't that far off, mm -hmm. but she loved it. So, and then she also became a crystal mermaid. Do you know what that is? I <laughs> do not. Please inform me. <laughs> Uh, she, be, it's, it's, uh, synchronized swim dancing. Oh. So at like 80, she would put on her little bathing cap and little, uh, bathing suit and kick with the other ladies and do choreography in the water. And she loved it. And so I just love the idea of like being an octogenarian crystal mermaid. I think that's fabulous. That is. And the idea is that suited her and it's not what people should do. But if she had listened to the message of her time, she should have just stayed on the rocking chair, kind of um, be quiet, let the next generation lead. And she just grabbed life so fiercely. And I just want to empower people to do that. And, and it doesn't sound like she had any, yeah, she didn't have any set boundaries for what she could or couldn't do. So she was always learning something. Have you ever met anybody in, in your clientele, Bridget, who you can tell that they've shut down that inner learning, that craving for knowledge and new experiences and, and personal and social growth and what do you do to try to invoke that spirit of exploration in them? Um, that's a great question. I'm going to answer it two different ways. I do remember a long time ago, I remember someone I knew uh, when I was younger, say she was 24 years old. She was, um, and this is before I was a therapist, so I was the same age. She was putting down the music of the 14-year-olds. It was awesome. Uh, unbelievable. And I remember thinking even then, oh my God, you're 24 and you're putting <laughs> down music. Like, like I want to be one of those, um, octogenarians and nanogenarians who, when a eight year old says, Hey, listen to this, I want to be able to go, wow. And then if I don't like it because I don't like it, that's fine. And so that's, that was a person who wasn't a client, but I was stunned. You're locking it in at 24. Mm, and then yeah. the other one is, um, a client who was so stuck and 
this particular client, she struggled with an eating disorder. And I often, and, and that's about control. And so I think it's about helping people explore their relationship with their controlling selves. In this case, it was eating disorder, but it could also be substance use. And then what are they controlling for? And trying to bring in, actually, I'm thinking of another client. Yeah, there's been several where I would try to bring in, you can have your opinions and I will support you as a person, but time is marching on. And so I have often said that, not uh, in a mean way, but, you know, like if someone is ambivalent about having a baby and they're like 40, I'm like, it's time to wrap up the uh, ambivalence because not making a decision is a decision. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so in that case, it's usually people who, of course, for their own trauma reasons, again, it served its purpose originally, is the control selves. And that's what you have to deal with so that it's okay to let go and then let in something new, like new learning. Okay. Right, right, right. Okay. So it seems like uh, uh, voice dialogue is really quite adaptable for many circumstances and can be helpful. Do you think it's like, do you think that inner conflict is uh, the basis of most, what most psychotherapies are up to? Uh, that's Such putting you, I'm putting you, I'm putting you on the spot here, right? And then you're going to get a lot of hate mail when everyone says no. <laughs> it's about it's about regulating your autonomic nervous system or <laughs> psychodynamics or whatever. Yeah, right. It's about psychoeducation and uh, tell them how it is, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> that's um. I love the question. I think fundamentally. Yes, if there is access. In other words, I always like to say if there is, isn't access due to systemic racism or oppression, that's not a psychological issue. It mm. affects you psychologically. Mm. But um, And so you're still going to be working with someone psychologically. Yeah. But I like to really uh, distinguish and not make... People like I have worked with people who are not legally here, for example, or the dreamers whose legal status is still yeah. tenuous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm I actually am quite politically like that's not a psychological problem. No, that's it not isn't. You. No, absolutely. But, and you have so to, in that case, yeah, I think you yeah. have to reinforce to people. No, you're feeling bad because you're being oppressed and the oppression is quite real. Exactly. Yeah, right, or yeah. the same with abuse. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. it's okay to miss yeah. him. And yes, you must leave him. It is not okay for him to hit you. And that's where the voice dialogue or, or any other kind of psychotherapy would be more of an inner dynamic process. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Along with the modicum, a, health, a healthy dose of uh, probably some case management at times. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Like, did you make that appointment? Yeah, I, exactly. You cannot come into the office until you make that appointment. Every that's, now and then you need to do that. That's pretty harsh. Okay. I, I'll make sure I make those appointments uh, before I call you up again. Um, so... <laughs> Um, right. See what self I'm in, and then I'll hang up. Uh, you can either hang up or, or keep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Call me back when you're ready, other self. Right. Yeah. When my uh, good girl is back, I'm on. <laughs> well, um, so maybe uh, before we wrap up here, we could maybe you could give some tips about how people, besides reading your wonderful book. Uh, or calling you or other voice dialogue folks or people who work with, you know, parts therapy of various kinds. Maybe there's some tips you could give to people who might be like reaching a new plateau or stage in their life, whether it's retirement, whether it's some kind of an aging plateau or empty nest syndrome or whatever it might be. What kind of a tip might you be able to give them or uh, to, to handle it a little bit better? I have a few exercises which are really great and portable. So one is you could do what I call an inner selfie report and literally notice throughout the day what parts of you are being triggered. And so you might lead with the, like with the empty nest syndrome, with the, with the busy buddy mom or something like that. And just notice it. And let's say you feel angry. 
but you don't say anything, that would be like two selves, the angry self that wanted to say something and the self that the diplomatic self, maybe that didn't. So starting to notice that this is just natural, that there's different parts of you that are going on all day long. And I like people to do it for a work day or whatever that work would be and a non-work day because different selves live in different arenas. Mm -hmm. The other thing is what I call my tug of war exercise. So you take something, let's say, um, uh, you know, do I retire this year or do I wait till next year? Mm -hmm. But you, you frame it so that there's two sides <laughs> and then you list the s sides of you that are for it. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to a pro and con list. And you could even start there, but then it's like, which selves, if it's a fearful self that says, no, don't retire yet. Don't retire yet. You want to talk to that self, but that might not be the best self to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those are really powerful ways because again, it gets you out of the, your shoulds or what you think is the proper way to go. And th that would be a self that says, well, here's just how it is self. And then when that's, when you ask that self, and this is a wonderful question to ask a self is how do you know what you know? So if a self says, no, you got to wait till you're 67 to do X. Maybe that self is correct, but it's like, oh, how do you know what you know? And that mm -hmm. often s stops a self cold. Like, how do I know what I know? Where'd that number come like, from? What's 67 mean? What is that? Yeah. Why? Exactly. Why? Right. Yeah. Who's saying that? What part's saying that? Yeah. And you're making me think of something very poignant, too, is a lot of times people's parents and loved ones have died at a particular age mm. that they are approaching. So when you just said that, like, it might be that one of their parents died when they were 66 and they want to, they want to, it could be sort of magical thinking, but if I'm working till I'm 67, then I won't have that same fate. We have selves that you might label superstitious, but they are welcome to the table just as much as any self. How, again, w welcome the self. Where do you live in the body? What are your beliefs? And again, how do you know what you know? Oh, my grandmother used to say, don't put your pocketbook down on the floor because you're, you'll never have money that way. You know, sometimes these are really beautiful connections. And it's like, I don't care if it's true or not, but I love it because my grandma said, and I'm going to always do it because I love my grandma. And great. Yeah. Okay. And, and you, you take some of the mystery out of it, but it reinforces the reasons for, yeah, consciousness. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if grandma lost all her money because it was under the mattress and there was that big house fire, then that's like something where you don't want to listen to grandma. <laughs> no, you don't want to keep your money in the mattress be, if be precisely that's why we have banks. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up here? No, it just said it's been such a pleasure and I love our discussion of these parts. Yeah, I think it it seems to to flow rather smoothly. I think we're we we're, we're grokking each other, right? We're we're getting each other here <laughs> as Valentine Michael Smith would say. Um I the book is what? The final eighth, enlist your inner selves to accomplish your goals. And what the press? New World Library okay. has published it. And, and actually, the audio book should be out uh, later this year in the in early fall, maybe ooh, even late summer ooh, for okay. those that don't uh, have time to actually look at a paper book. Did you? Um, and, and, and also, it might be better to facilitate the exercises that are in it for a lot of people. Exactly. exactly. And is it, are you, is it your lovely presence on the audio book? Yes. Wow. It will be me. Kudos to you. Oh, and, and, ah. Yeah, good. A lot of people have other people read their books these days, um, which is great for voice My actors. My former performer will not allow me to give that <laughs> job away. <laughs> As a former performer who still performs in some capacities, I agree. I get. I grok that too. Um, how can people get a hold of you, Bridget? So I'm on social media, Final Eighth finaleighth.com or my name, Bridget Dangle Gaspard. And like I said, third Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, please join us. It's amazing. We do a live voice dialogue session and then we do a little group exercise. So anyone who's a part of it can really get a sense of the voice dialogue. Mm -hmm. And on Instagram, on the eighth of every month at 8 p.m., I go live to just discuss how to operate with your different selves. 
And um, a new series I'm putting out is called Check Yourselves, Adulting 101. And we gather a group of people and really it's a conversation that, again, embraces vulnerability. And we've uh, covered topics like black wellness in real time, uh, LGBTQ, a and I, and what selves were allowed and how did you navigate them? And they're just so powerful. And so it's not void, void, about voice dialogue, but it's about how we operate with ourselves. You said adulting, and I think that's a term that's been applied to or, or uh, apprehended <laughs> by <laughs> millennials. Is this a millennial thing or is this in all ages? Is Zoomers can participate if they get along with the millennials in the group or <laughs> whatever whatever we're supposed to, to do as far as our generation gaps. But uh, is it mostly millennials or is it all, uh, other folks oh, from all over? Oh, it's everybody. No, cool. it's across the board, both in age um, gender, color, culture. We really are trying to make it so that, uh, everyone learns something that they hadn't cool. perhaps thought of and to inspire again, people's thinkings that they don't have to accept the status quo. And especially after the pandemic and everyone starting to come out and we don't know how it's all going to unfold, but if you didn't like something before, don't go back to it. Like, gather the courage to make your life different. And I'm really adamant about that. And that's part of it. Like if your victim, it's hopeless selves are saying, you've got no choice. I'm here to say, don't listen to them. Love those parts, get help because now is such an amazing time for you to actually shift and not go back to stuff you didn't like. It's the beginning of the new beginning, yeah, in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of people are doing that naturally by shifting jobs and going, oh, wait, I don't have to do this job. I could do that job or I could do remote work here and not have to go back to the bank or not go back to the office. And yeah, I think that people are really shifting things up, which is kind of off topic, but I think it's driving... (laughs) <laughs> I think it's driving people who follow work statistics uh, and the media crazy. We have to get back to the way it was. We have to get I I'm not looking forward to that. I kind of like the slower pace and the lack of uh, busy, 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 you know. Oh, yes. And let them go crazy. Just try hard to not listen to them. Cultivate those parts where, again, that's one idea. Does it resonate with you? I mean, the classic cliche is at one point, everyone thought the world was flat and it only took a hundred years. And then only a few people think the world's flat. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank thank goodness for paradigm shifts. Uh, But it looks like like we're in a big paradigm shift now and you're going to be part of that, which is great. Okay. Well, thank you. As are you. you. Well, of course. Well, thank you so much again for being here. Um, I look forward to maybe seeing a book on uh, change across the lifespan through voice dialogue, maybe, maybe something like that in the future. It sounds like it's still percolating there. Yes. No. And thank you for planting that seed, but it's percolating as I get older. (laughs) (laughs) As you get younger backwards or something like that. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. And you too, Scott. Thank you. listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know that the Psychology Talk podcast has a Facebook page and an Instagram page? It's true. You can find more information about other guests, episodes, as well as more information about psychology and mental health. And if you liked this episode, go ahead and like us on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, or Spotify and leave a review. It helps us grow our audience and provide more quality shows. All material, copyright the Psychology Talk podcast. This podcast is for informative and entertainment purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. <laughs>